there. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So again, thanks for joining us today. We're going to talk about the Workforce Education Grants. This is a similar presentation that I did during uh, the Division of Career and Technical Education CTE Summer Conference in August, also online. Um, but I thought with a couple weeks to go here before these grants open up for applications, it would be a great time to refresh everybody's memory on what these grants are available for and maybe give you some inspiration to uh, get started on your own workforce education grant projects. So, um, let's see. Sorry about that. We've got more people in the waiting room. There we go. Okay. Background of the workforce education grants, just for those of you who are not familiar, this is a grant fund established by the South Dakota legislature in 2013. Uh, the, it's specific to CTE programs. Uh, SB 235 is the legislative rule that uh, authorizes these grants. Uh, and it's to provide schools and nonprofit private entities uh, who provide any sort of special career and technical education training in South Dakota to make transformative change in their programs. The key point there is transformative change. Uh, these are kind of, we're looking for big picture ideas that uh, will offer your students new opportunities, hopefully. So the maximum award amount for any grant application is $225,000. And these workforce education grants are awarded through a competitive submission and review process. So we have an experienced review committee. Um, several of these folks have been doing this for just year after year reviewing these grants. They donate their time. They're, tech, they're generally people in uh, secondary and post-secondary education, former CTE teachers, directors, business and industry and community members, uh, often in the same area of the state for the grants that they're reviewing. So they uh, really, I try to get a committee that spans East River, West River, just a really versatile group of people that reviews the grants and they take a look at them on their own time and they score them and they write down questions and concerns and then we meet as a group and they talk everything out and uh, they, our office doesn't make any determinations on who receives this grant, we just kind of coordinate the conversation and they make a decision on a 100 point uh, rubric system and that's how these grants are selected. So uh, when you submit your workforce education grant, it's really important, like I said earlier, to think of this as a big picture project. These should not be just one-off projects or uh, just you know, in, you know, independent equipment purchases like you would typically use. Those of you who are familiar with CTE, not something you'd just you know, ask for for your Perkins funding to pay for or whatnot. These are big picture projects, new programs, new buildings, new equipment. Um, and so all that added up might be a big picture project, but these are, I think the minimum re award that we've given out in the last few years is about $12,000. And with the match, that's a, you know, almost a $25,000 project. So that's what we consider big picture. But obviously, with the matching funds, your projects can go up to $450,000 or more. So that's what we're looking for. And that's what the review committee is going to be looking for is really grand, grand plans. The teams are expected to make significant and meaningful improvements to your current technical education program. So what we're looking for is brand new program offerings or transformative changes to one of your existing programs. And then the workforce education grants are one-time awards. Um, if additional grants are available in the future from the funds, um, you won't be able to reapply for a grant to sustain um, the same project. Part of your responsibility in applying for this grant is proving sustainability on your end. All right, grant purpose and eligibility. Um, this is this slide's very specific to local education agencies, and I know that I have some nonprofit folks on with me today. So just uh, keep in mind that the rules for the nonprofits are a little bit different and I'll share, share the resources with you later where you can um, find those differences. Uh, nonprofits, they're actually eligible for up to $250,000 in total out of this fund. 
Um, so just keep that in mind that some of the stuff that I'm sharing today is specific to local education agencies. So the workforce education grants are designed to support and align secondary school systems, their CTE programs, and South Dakota's post-secondary education programs and workforce needs. The whole goal is to develop the state's talent pipeline for workforce development and economic growth in our communities. And then the LEA projects are intended to serve middle and high school students. Um, Perkins 5 legislation has changed now to include um, fifth grade through 12th grade. Uh, we have not extended our Perkins funding down to fifth grade yet, but on a national level, Perkins 5 is intended to serve uh, students as early as fifth grade now. I mean, if we had our way, uh, CTE would be in kindergarten, but um, just keep in mind that for some schools, middle school is fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Um, so keep that in mind when you're considering projects. We love to see some of those middle school projects as well. Keeping it simple, projects must meet the following criteria. They need to build, reform, or enhance an approved secondary program. So there's always a little bit of confusion here. You might wanna add a new program that isn't tech, doesn't technically exist yet or you don't have approval for. And um, we want you to be very clear that your program application or your application for this grant can be to create a brand new program. And obviously you have time to get that program approved if you would happen to be awarded the grant and part of your whole purpose is to start a new program, you would work with our office to get that program approved while you're getting your grants underway. So don't think about just what you're already doing, think about what you could be doing. So, um, and then your projects also need to align to high skill, high demand and high wage careers and post-secondary edu education programs in South Dakota. And your programs or your applications need to demonstrate the ability to complete the project. Now back to the high skill, high demand and high wage careers. The Department of Labor and Regulation here in South Dakota works very closely with our office with the CTE folks um, to make sure that a lot of what we're working towards and funding and whatnot is applicable to the needs out there in the workforce. And as part of the guidance documents that I'll share, I'll share the link with you at the end of this to the guidance documents. There's all kinds of definitions and resources and links on there to the DLR, DLR information. So you can take a really good look at that and know that your application is focused on one of those high skill, yeah. high demand and high wage career options. So just keep that in mind. Absolutely. So um, you're student teaching for who? Uh, me. Okay. Um, and Dakota West Nair, the world, we're the one that's our all the things from that one. I'm just going to go ahead and mute everybody there just so we can get through this. All right. Next up here. Your proposed projects must fall within one or more of the following categories. Obviously, if it falls in more than one category, all the better. But the review committee is going to very specifically be looking for your project or your plans to fit into one of these categories. Um, so I'm not going to read through them all. You all can see that. But just keep in mind that it's, it's almost impossible for any project to come through our office that doesn't fit into one of these categories. And very often it's a combination of um, facilities and equipment seem to be the big, the, big, the big ideas that have come through the last couple of years. But um, this like we're really focused on development of career pathways and programs of study and things like that. And just making sure that the focus remains on, yeah, I mean, a great, a brand new building is great, but what's, what's gonna happen there? What's gonna be the end result? How many students is that gonna impact and how is that gonna affect your community? All right, so this is everybody's 
favorite part of the workforce education grant and easily what I get the most questions on. So I'll spend as much time on this as I can, hopefully to make clear everything up for you. So these grants require a one-to-one -one match, meaning that the full amount requested from the state grant funds must be matched in an equal amount from non-state grant funds. Now, the match can come from any source um, it can be in-kind donations, monetary contributions. It can come right from the local educational agency. So it can be district funds. It can be contributions from the community, community. Or if you have a business and industry partner that you're working with, they can donate actual money. They can donate in-kind um, donations, time, energy, equipment, uh, the matching funds have to be documented just as well as the funds that you're seeking reimbursement for. So this, this grant is not money up front. You will expend your money and your resources, and then you will turn all of your documentation into our office for reimbursement. And anything that's coming your way from a matching source has to have the same documentation as any dollars that you're seeking reimbursement for. So they need to be adequately documented. Uh, whatever you're proving for matching funds needs to be necessary and reasonable for accomplishment of your project. They need to be provided for and approved in your budget. So when you submit your program or your application for this grant, you'll, uh, you'll submit your budget. Um, and I want you to keep in mind that it's very normal for those budgets to change. We have um, monies that are promised from business and industry or community members, and it doesn't pan out. So you have to seek a different source during the process of your grant project. And you'll just work with me um, at, at, in our office and we'll work on adjusting those budgets as needed. But whenever you submit something for reimbursement, it has to fit in one of our approved budget categories. So um, just keeping track of all of the invoices and paperwork and everything is probably the most important thing to getting your money reimbursed. The values for the contributions and services and property must be established as they would for federal grants in accordance with uh, that federal statute there. So say you have someone in a business or industry capacity volunteering their hours and you're gonna use that as matching funds. So you're having them coming in and helping an instructor or doing some of the building or whatnot. Um, you have to make sure that those contributions are um, recorded as such as the IRS would, like volunteer hours have a, have a certain rates and things like that per hour and whatnot. So you'll have to work with your bookkeepers, your business managers at your school often to, to figure out those numbers. And then a lot of people get confused when I, what we mean by matching funds. So I'm gonna cover this as in depth as I can. Um, In-kind contributions. So if you as a teacher are spending 10 hours a week specifically on this project and the school wants to submit um, documentation for those 10 hours and prorate it you know, to whatever your um, hourly wage or divisible salary would be, that's what we mean by in-kind contributions. So as long as it's connected to the grant project, you can use those hours, or if you work hours above and beyond and things like that. And then anytime that industry professionals donate, just having a meeting, advising, coaching your students, coaching a teacher on what kind of equipment you're going to need for your project or your facility, advising, um, a big one is equipment donation. Uh, business or industry members often have equipment that they need to update, and it's perfectly usable for high school kids to, um, you know, try out and, and get their projects done with. And, and we appreciate, you know, being able to recycle those things. So they would put a value on anything that they would donate, new or used. And that's what we mean by in-kind contributions. So, and then of course, everybody likes monetary contributions and they can come from donations, other grants. If you have another grant, like a community grant you're applying for. Um, and then if the, or if the school district has funds that they wanna put towards the project or investments or land, land is a big one. Um, that's something to think about. We just obviously need the documentation 
to um, verify the value of that land. So, so that's what I mean by matching funds. All right. Okay. And I added this example question because I've never not been asked this in a private conversation about workforce education grants. So I just thought it would be a good one to include just to make sure we're clear on this. Can matching funds come from more than one source? Yes, I think I've made that pretty clear. Um, you can have all different kinds of sources. However, any of those sources and any of those matching funds have to be necessary and reasonable to um, accomplish whatever the goal of your project objective is. And it has to be approved for in the budget. So it's um, matching funds are easily the most confusing part of this grant process for folks. And so um, it's just really important to understand that yes, they can come from different sources, but every additional source that you add to meet your match is just more that you have to keep track of on your end, so. Keep that in mind. All right, and this is another question I get asked a lot, so I wanted to include it. Um, I have to deal with this on almost every grant that we consider in-kind um, in kind matching for. And so what documents do we need to provide if we're including compensation? This gets people pretty tripped up. This is often what slows down our reimbursement process. So just, I want to make sure that it's um, clear on this end of the projects that staff compensation is an eligible match source and time and effort logs must be kept during the grant period to accurately track the amount of time that that staff person devoted to the project. So those time and effort logs are important. That is something our office can provide templates for. Often most schools have um, your business manager will have their own time and effort logs that, they'll, that they can provide for you to use. But um, just seek out whatever documentation you need on the front end of your project so you're not playing catch up on the back end when you're going to seek reimbursement. All right, and this is the timeline for, oh, there we go. I'll let somebody else in, somebody's a little late. Okay, approximate grant timeline. So February 15th, I realized for some of you that's a holiday. Um, it's a holiday for the state employees, but I am going to open up the grants on that day. It's a Monday morning. Um, so February 15th will be uh, our date that we'll start accepting applications. There isn't a actual physical application that you fill out. You take a look at the grant guidance that we have on our website and there's um, lots of tips on there and there's some budget templates and things like that that you're welcome to use, but your application and what re we require is laid out on that guidance and then everybody's application um, looks different. Um, as you know, grant writing is what many of you, that there's someone in your district or whatever that does that for you but um, every application will look different. So that'll happen on February 15th. And then um, March 31st, I believe is the deadline. So you'll have about six weeks to get those in. Um, and then my review committee will spend about two and a half weeks reviewing and meeting and choosing and things like that. And we will announce uh, April 19th is I believe the date we've chosen to announce grant winners. Um, and then I will work with those of you who have received grants on your contract. That's usually a pretty um, rigorous process. Our contracts office goes everything over everything with a fine tooth comb and we expect you to as well. You'll um, work with me to get that contract completed and then you'll receive an electronic copy of that contract to sign at some point. We'll have those wrapped up by the end of May um, and then on June 1st of 2021, your projects can begin. And then you'll see here July 2nd, October 1st, January 6th, April 1st, July 1st. Those are estimated dates that our office requires progress reports um, on your grant progress. 
Now, every time you submit a reimbursement request, you're also required to submit a progress report. Um, it's not part of the grant rules, but I generally just encourage people to submit a reimbursement request at by each one of those dates. So they're not seeking um, reimbursement for the whole grant at once. And they're kind of um, crossing some of that paperwork and stuff off of their list and filing it away each quarter. So you're not dealing with so much paperwork and, and budgets and whatnot. And then this round of grants will need to be completed by November 1st of 2022. And so that's 18 months from start to finish. And I also, I had this question yesterday. I had somebody actually call and talk to me about the grants yesterday. And someone asked about sustainability and that's completely your responsibility. We like to see your plans for sustainability in your grant application. But once that grant completion date comes and goes, our office has no control over your grant. So um, like, of course, we hope that <laughs> these grand projects turn into something, you know, long lasting, sustainable, and they impact many people. But once that grant completion date is over, your contract with the state ends. And so your grant, can go whichever direction, your project or, or new facility or whatever can go whichever direction you choose. All right, reimbursement requests. This is the not fun part of um, managing workforce education grants. It gets kind of frustrating. So if you're the person that's considering applying for one of these grants, I strongly encourage you to work with your school's business manager to um, understand what documentation is necessary and what budget categories look like at your school versus what they look like for our finance office and things like that, just so you can keep everything straight because we do have some non-negotiable things here. So at least one reimbursement with corresponding required supporting documents must be submitted each quarter to cover the expenditures in, incurred in that during that quarter. Now, like I said, we've had some situations where the grant project has just been one big purchase and we've just had to do the reimbursement all at the end. Um, usually that's when it's very minimal invoices and the entire grant um, funding was one item, but it's easier for you on your end to try to submit those reimbursements every quarter along with your progress reports. So they must be accompanied by your progress report um, they're subject to adequate progress on the project's goals. So if our office does not see progress on the project, the finance um, folks at the state might decline payment until they see that progress. Uh, documentation must be available to support all expenditures and those expenditures must be approved before the end of the grant period. Local education agencies are required to utilize their financial accounting system to track financial expenditures. And that's the key where I mentioned working with your business manager, the finance people at your school to make sure that what you, the work you're doing is matching on um, their financial expectations as well. All right, and then here's a sample progress report um, template. I have these in my office often. It's just a Word file that somebody's typed up a couple of, uh, somebody's just typed up a couple of paragraphs about what their project is looking like and they'll attach a couple photos for us. And that's all I need. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be too in depth. We just need to see this wasn't happening and now this is happening. But anytime you ask me for any of these templates, I'm happy to provide them for you. All right. And then Like I mentioned at the beginning, the reimbursement requests, um, your grant funds being requested have the same reimbursement request rules as the matching funds. So I have to have financial, even, even though the state's not reimbursing you for anything that you're showing me from your matching funds, those doc, the documentation is the same whether or not we're actually reimbursing. And we can't reimburse you for a single dollar more than what you've provided proof of matching funds. So I won't read through all this, but just remember that one-to-one, -one, that's one-to-one -one on everything. And, you have, and the documentation is the most important part of that. All right. 
So this is the accounting form that is submitted to finance. And this will be provided to you if you're awarded a grant, you will be provided with copies of these forms. Uh, I have worked with the finance office this year to come up with this form. Um, it's the best, it's kind of the best of both worlds. It's all of the mistakes that everybody's made over the last few years and everything that's caused a lot of headaches for people. We kind of made note of all of that and put it all into one form. So you'll have a claim form for your grant funds and then you'll have a claim form for your matching funds and they're identical, but this is just a way, it'll come to you in an Excel file and then you can keep them separate on there. But along with your grant assurances and certification statement, that's something you have to sign in the contract. It's uh, Appendix C of the grant guidance that you'll be getting access to here. Um, all applicants must have their business manager or finance staff review the budget for accuracy. And then here's a copy. It's, it's identical, except for it's a form for matching funds. Um, so that's just some tips and tricks to make things easier when you're working on reimbursement. I've said it several times now, submit the same supporting documentation for matching funds as you will for grant funds. Clearly indicate which invoices and supporting documents are being submitted for proof of match versus funds for reimbursement. Label everything. Just come up with your own labeling system. A is everything that you need reimbursement for. B is everything that's a matching source document. So whatever you need to do to keep it organized on your ends. What to expect after submitting a grant request? Well, our office is gonna organize everything, put it together. I'm gonna to submit it to the Department of Education's Finance Office. They may send it back to me and say, hey, this isn't clear, can you straighten this out with so-and-so? So I'll contact you, that usually, that, that's typical. And then once they have a correct reimbursement request, it takes two to three weeks to complete it on the finance office's end. And then another seven to 10 days to get to you. And that depends on if you are having your funds reimbursed electronically or by paper check. So. All right, so any questions you might have? And then this link right here, I will click on it and show you. Um, that will take you right to our page on the Department of Education website. You can just go to the DOE website and search for workforce education grants to get here as well. But if you click on the documents tab right down here, 2021 workforce education grant LEA guidance, that's what most of you are going to be looking at. And then any nonprofit organizations that are interested will look at the one below that. But this is what it is and it's about 29 pages long. Um, don't let that scare you. A lot of it is sample pages of the budget sheets. And then I know the final, and then it shows you a copy of the rubric that the review committee will use for scoring. And then the last page is um, definitions and resources for you to access while you're in that application process. So not too scary. And then if you have any questions specific to your school or your region, I also included um, I also included contact information for each of our regional specialists here. And it's not going to the last page, but most of you know who your regional specialists are, so feel free to contact them. If or me, you can always contact me as well since I do manage the grants for our office. But if you have any questions. Um, feel free to reach out and just uh, sometimes people just like to talk through what they're thinking about applying for. And that's a great idea as well. So. All right. Um, does anybody have any questions before we log off? I am going to go to the chat box here. There we go. Can these grants be used to start a CTE program? Yes, absolutely. 
You work with your regional specialist. You'll talk to them about what program you want to get started, and you'll make sure you include that program in your spring applications that'll come up here in March and April. Absolutely. That's a great question. You were talking about um, the staff compensation, the time and effort logs. Is that just for um, the time put in planning this project or does oh. that count like the classes? No, that no. We... Well, if it's something, if it's something that you're doing on top of your normal teaching okay. um, that's related to the grant, yes, you can use that time. Okay. But we couldn't use like our salary as a matching. Um, if it's so technically, yes, if you're starting a new program and that's the only way you can fund it, you can work that into your grant budget. OK, what about yep. I have a question here in chat on um, what is the maximum grant amount? The maximum grant amount is two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars. So with your matching funds, that's a minimum of a four hundred and fifty thousand dollar project. Now, keep in mind, your matching funds can go above and beyond. Um, the 225. That being said, um, this year I think there's about a million dollars total available. So if there's two or three great huge projects or folks requesting that $225,000, then that obviously whittles down the total grants amount, but that's the most you can apply for. Oh, Colleen, yes, you can use the instructor salary and benefits as a matching fund. It just, it, it doesn't have to be a new program. It's just that it has to be specific to your, like you can't have a teacher's whole entire salary for classes you've already been teaching or other things that they're doing. It has to be directly related to your new, to your grant project. But yes, you can use the instructor salary and benefits for match. I have the chat open, so if you'd rather type a question in there, I'm, I'm reading those. If anybody has any other questions they'd like to ask verbally, feel free. All right, I will stay on the line for just a few more minutes um, in case anybody comes up with a question just as they're getting ready to sign off. But just remember, you can contact our office um, anytime, me specifically, if it's a grant specific question, if you'd like to discuss with your regional representative uh, a community minded project and they might have more insight on what what business and industry in your region is looking like you're welcome to do that as well but thank you so much for joining me today i hope this was helpful yes um if you want to email me i can send out the power you know what actually i'll have the powerpoint put on the workforce education grant uh web page that i showed you that way anybody can take a look at it so i'll have them upload it there so just go to the DOE website and in the search bar type in workforce education grants and you'll find our webpage. Thank you.